Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. So good to be with you. 2023, good riddance. Glad it's over. I was hoping the Lord would come back in 2023, but he didn't, so here's for hoping for 2024. <laughs> Even so, come Lord Jesus. Well, uh, I hope I still remember how to do this, but uh, we are, Wednesday night is a night that we have traditionally, since we've started this church, used it as our way of going through the Bible verse by verse chapter by chapter, book by book. It's how we started the church. We did not start with a Sunday morning or a weekend. We started with a midweek Bible study, going through the Gospel of John uh, in an apartment building not too far from here. And I announced my sermon title that night as John chapter one. Next week's sermon title, John chapter two. And people were then getting used to, okay, that's how we do church. We go a chapter by chapter, book by book, week by week. And we've now been through the Bible about three times, four times, if you, five times if you include the Bible from 30,000 feet. But now we're doing it, the Bible, from three feet, uh, not 30,000 feet. We're going uh, slower. And we're going through a section of the Bible that even if you are uh, an adroit Bible student, and you give yourself to it regularly, this is not familiar territory. For most believers, the Old Testament is not familiar. This church is an exception to that. But still, uh, this little section that we're going through, uh, you, you, you might be reminded of it by a couple of key verses, but for a lot of you, it still might be fresh territory. So we're gonna go for the next almost hour Again, this is for newcomers, uh, for old timers, you know this, this is, you could recite this. But um, we're gonna be, uh, we start where we left off and we just stop when the time's up and we pick it up next time. So we find ourselves in chapter eight of 2 Kings. So make your way to 2 Kings chapter eight. And we left off at verse six which means we are in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 7, right? <clears throat> really? I don't know. I figured you, you all knew how to count. So we finished 6 last time. <laughs> and we just keep going now. Um, but let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for, for the detailed and beautiful way you have recorded the revelation of who you are, what you have done, what you are going to do in this book. Some of it is historical narrative, some of it is poetry, uh, some of it uh, uh, is parable, but all of it is your word. And it is God breathed, it is inspired, you've given it to us so we might grow and we are here because we believe when we open the Bible that you open your mouth, that you speak through the revelation of Holy Scripture. So speak to us, we pray, in our individual dealings and circumstances, wanderings. And I pray, Father, that you would just give us a clear word of direction, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me set the, the tone and the scene here a little bit. We have been in this section of the Bible dealing with a notorious couple. And they, they in some form, appear again in this chapter. And history is filled with notorious couples. I can think of a few. Bonnie and Clyde, a notorious couple. Antony and Cleopatra, a historical notorious couple. Napoleon and uh, his love affair with, was it Bernadette? What is it? Josephine. 
Josephine, yeah. And the love letters, even though she was a married woman and, and et cetera, et cetera, all that scandal, a notorious couple. In the Bible, we have a couple like that named Ahab and Jezebel. They're singled out because Ahab alone was a wicked man, but he made things worse by marrying a woman slightly more wicked than himself named Jezebel, who was the daughter of a Sidonian king, uh, an outsider outside of Israel. He married her. She brought with her the worship of Baal into the kingdom, into the nation. Ahab went wholesale uh, into that worship system because of her. And we have been feeling the effects. Israel has been feeling the effects of that notorious relationship ever since. As an antidote to that relationship of wickedness between Ahab and Jezebel, as medicine to cure the idolatry that they brought, God sent two prophets, Elijah, 1 Kings, and his successor, Elisha, chiefly in 2 Kings. Elijah was the one who called fire down from heaven, was chased down to the wilderness by Jezebel, Elisha was the one who asked for a double portion, and he, as I said, succeeded. He is featured prominently here in this book. They, these two prophets, confronted the wickedness of this dynasty year after year after year. Back in 1 Kings, the Lord had told Elijah, that he was to leave and anoint three people. Now, you remember I said that he went down into the Sinai Desert. He was alone by himself. He feared for his life because Jezebel threatened his life. He said, I'm the only one serving you. God said, I have 7,000 just like you. Relax. But I want you to go back and I want you to anoint three people. One is a fellow by the name of Hazael, H-A-Z-A-E-L, up in Syria as the next king. Second, a guy by the name of Jehu as the next king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And third, I want you to anoint your successor, Elisha. Well, we have a record of him doing the third, but not the first two. We know that he gave his mantle, put that on Elisha. Elisha took up the ministry of prophet and the schools of the prophets and was a powerful voice for God in his generation. We don't have a record that Elijah anointed Hazael of Syria or Jehu of Israel. It could be that he met with them, had a conversation with them, or it could be that he fulfilled it by his successor, the one that he anointed last, or the, the third one God told him to anoint, and that was Elisha. Because here we have Elisha given the job of anointing Hazael and Jehu, the first two that Elijah should have done. So again, it could be that Elijah did that, we don't have a record of it, or it could be that God fulfilled that through the successor of Elijah named Elisha. Does that make sense? So that's where we pick it up in chapter eight. Now in chapter eight, there is um, a national disaster or a couple of national disasters that have been ongoing. They, they have happened in the past, they got resolved in the past, but then they happened again and happened again. And number one is a war with Syria. So you have Israel, the northern ten tribes, and Judah, the southern two tribes, those are God's people. Above them is the nation of Syria, under the leadership of Ben-Hadad 
and his commanding officer, Hazael. So they're always at war with these people, and they're fighting battles, and they're losing battles. That was a problem. The second problem was this recurring famine that would happen. Happened in the days of Elijah, happened in the days of Elisha. It got so bad, this famine, that in the middle of the country, in the kingdom of Israel, in the capital city of Samaria, the famine was so bad and the attacks from Syria were so bad that inflation was sky high. A donkey's head was selling for about 300 bucks a pop. A cup of dove's dung sold for about 45 bucks. So things were really bad. Now, God said they would be bad if they forsook him. 600 years before this, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and 29, God said, look, you're coming into the land. You obey me, it's going to be peachy keen. Well, God didn't say peachy keen, but he said, you'll do well. If you forsake me, if you chase other gods, if you disobey me, there's going to be famine in your land, nations are going to attack you, and eventually you're going to be ousted out of your territory altogether. They're on their way to that last one, but they're not there yet. So they have this, this problem, this uh, problem with Syria and the problem with the famine. What is happening spiritually by these two events is God is simply trying to get their attention. So sends them a famine, sends them a nation to attack them. They don't get the message, sends a more severe famine, other nations to attack them. They don't get the message. He just turns up the heat. What they should have been doing is looking around and noticing this and reading their Bibles to see, oh, this is the judgment of God. It says so in the book. We shouldn't be surprised by this. We're supposed to turn back to the Lord. So they weren't in that mindset, so God sent them a couple of prophets to remind them of that. Likewise, I think that we, as believers, living in this world, should look around at the things going on in our world. Because I think God is trying to warn us, as a nation, as a world, that things are happening around the globe like the Bible predicted. There are wars and rumors of wars. In fact, as we speak, there's 110 armed conflicts going on right now on planet Earth. They're just becoming more and more widespread. Things that are happening in the Middle East, things that are happening with Russia, aligning with Iran and Turkey, etc. Some of that we've gone through in the past. These should be signals to us like God wanted to get their attention, I think God wants to get our attention. And if ever there was a time to fulfill what we're talking about on Sunday mornings, Kingdom City, this is the time. This is our hour. We are here for such a time as this. So, with that as background, we get into chapter 8, verse 7. Then, then Elisha, that's the successor of Elijah, Elisha went to Damascus, that's the capital of the kingdom of Syria, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazael, remember that's that name that Elijah was told you're going to be the next king. Anoint him as the king of Syria. And the king said to Hazael, Hazael is the governor and the chief officer of his army, his captain. The king said to Hazael, take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God. 
and inquire of the Lord, and notice the word Lord is capitalized, so it's speaking of Yahweh, that's the covenant name. So he is isolating the fact that down in Israel, they worship this God, Yahweh. We worship Hadad. Go inquire of Yahweh by him saying, shall I recover from this disease? Okay, we got to unpack a couple of things. He's up in Syria. He's up in Damascus. He's not in the territory where the people of God hang out. These are not Israelites. These are Syrians. And yet... Up in Syria, they know of this man of God from Israel. And so he shows up in town, shows up in Damascus. It gets all the way to the king. Hey, the, the man of God is here. Really? Well, I know about the man of God. This, I'm sick. Go see if I'm going to get better. Have him inquire of Yahweh to see if I'm going to get better. Now, here's a question. How do you think these people in a non-Jewish pagan environment know of this man of God? Well, jog your memory a few weeks back, there was another commander of the forces of Syria who had leprosy by the name of Naaman. And remember, Naaman was getting sicker by the day, and his wife had a little maid who was a captive from the Israelite camp, and she said, I just wish my master, master could meet the man of God down in Samaria named Elisha, because I know if, if those two could meet, that that prophet, that man of God, would heal him. So he goes down to see Elisha, and Elisha says, go dunk yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and you'll be cleansed. And he gets all upset. What do you, why would I go in that ugly little, it looks like the Rio Grande River. Why is it just, <laughs> rivers of Syria are better and less muddy than this thing. And his servant said, look, if the man of God asked you to, to do a great thing, you would have done it. He's asking you to do some little dumb little thing like get in the water seven times. What do you got to lose? So he went down once, nothing happened. Twice, nothing happened. Three times, nothing happened. Four, nothing. Five, nothing. Six. Finally, the last time, seven times he dunked, he came up, skin like a baby, completely healed of leprosy. Then he gets all excited and he uh, wants to take as much earth from that dirt from Israel as he can, saddled on his donkey and build an altar up in Syria. He was so impressed. So when Naaman comes back up, no doubt, Naaman spread the word because everybody knew he had a disease, now he's cured. So the next question is, how'd that work out? Well, there's this guy, a man of God named Elisha. So the king knew of Elisha. And I find it interesting that the king of Syria is more interested in inquiring to Yahweh, to God, then the king of Israel is interested in inquiring of God. The king of Israel won't inquire of God, is disobedient to God. Here you have a pagan king in another country who hears and in hearing says, go see if I'm going to get better. Shall I recover from this disease? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus. Now, I don't know what every good thing of Damascus would be. I'm guessing olive oil and dates and pistachios and all those things that are prominent in the Middle East. But notice how much of these good things. 40 camel loads. That's quite an honorarium. That's quite a gift. 40 camels filled with all the good things of Damascus and said, notice how he asked the question, your son, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, has sent me to you saying, shall I recover from this disease? And Elisha said to him, go and say to him, you shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Now, what's going on here? Here's what's going on. 
He's not going to die of this disease. This disease is not going to kill him. But he is going to die. This disease is not fatal, Hazael. But he's going to die because you're going to murder him. You're going to get to that in a minute. So this disease, nope, he'll recover. Yet the Lord has really shown me he's going to go, tell him he's going to be fine. Go tell him he's going to recover. This disease isn't going to kill him. So, however, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Now, that could be said of all of us. We're all fatal. From time to time, I talk to people who say, I just went to the doctor, and the doctor said, my disease is fatal. Now, I don't tell them out loud, but I think inside so am I. My condition is also fatal, right? All of us. You know, it's, it's, it's sometimes amazes me that people still get shocked that their loved ones die. Even though so far, it's been a one-to-one -one ratio. His, in history, everyone who's ever lived, with an exception of like, um, people who were taken up into heaven like Elijah, but usually everyone born dies. Even if you pray for healing and you get healed, and we rejoice that you do get healed, it's still fatal. You're still eventually going to die. So what is said of this king could be said of all of us. Yeah. You're going to recover, but you're really going to die at some point. Then he, then he, the prophet, set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed and the man of God wept. So they're having this conversation and suddenly Elisha just stops and just stares into the eye of Hazael and just says nothing, but just keeps staring him down, eyes open, staring at him till it gets embarrassing. Have you ever had somebody just stare at you and it gets spooky after a while? It's like, dude, what's up? He just keeps looking at him and keeps looking at him. He's starting to feel ashamed now and feel embarrassed. And then the prophet just begins to weep. And Hazael said, why is my Lord weeping? And he answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire. Their young men you will kill with a sword and you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. So Hazael said, but what is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. Remember that the prophets were at one time referred to as seers because they could see into the future of a person. And Elisha was so tuned in to God that when God didn't reveal something to him, it mystified him. When a woman was coming to him and she was in deep distress, Elisha said to his servant, this lady is in deep distress and God has not revealed what's going on. And, and that surprised Elisha. I told you a couple of times, I get surprised when the Lord does speak to me. He got surprised when the Lord didn't speak to him. So here's this prophet, and he's looking at Hazael, and he knows, he sees, he predicts he's going to be the next king of Israel. But he starts weeping because he sees, he portends and predicts and prophesies all of the evil that he is going to enact while he is king of Syria. Now, while he says, you're an evil guy and you're going to do all these atrocities, the guy immediately denies it. What do you think I am, a dog? No, actually, you're worse than a dog by these things. And the prophet just begins to weep. This also interests me that he 
was unaware of just how evil his own heart was, how capable he was of doing evil. He wasn't aware that he was as, as capable as doing these atrocities. The human heart, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all else, desperately wicked, who can know it? Uh, David said in Psalm 51, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. We all are born with what theologians refer to as original sin. So we're made in the image of God, but the image of God was marred because choices were made that violated the intent of the creator. And so the image of God has been marred. Adam marred the image of God by disobedience. Man was created in the image of God, but the Bible says after man's sin that Adam had a son in his image after his likeness because now he passes on that sin that we call original sin to every single person throughout history, to everybody's tainted with sin, which means every person, every unredeemed person especially, is capable, given the right circumstances, of the worst possible atrocities. You may not see it, you may not think, oh no, I'm, I know me, I'm the perfect person. I could never do such things. Like this guy denies that he could ever stoop this low. But this prophet begins to weep because he sees this as future reality. And as he weeps, he enters into the company of other weepers in the Bible. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he wrote the book of Lamentations. He weeps over the city of Jerusalem as it is destroyed by the Babylonians. Jesus similarly wept over the city of Jerusalem. And now Elisha weeps over the future of his own people. As this man, Hazael, will become the king of Syria and more battles and more atrocities and more violence will occur. I think if Elisha the prophet could have looked far, far forward all the way to October 7th, 2023, at what Hamas did in Gaza, from Gaza into southern Israel, doing the same kinds of things, incinerating babies, beheading children, uh, killing parents, uh, butchering them, raping them, he also would have wept like he does here for this. Atrocious. And all this guy does is denies it. Like, what do you think I could even... Who do you think I am, a dog? Then he departed from Elisha, verse 14, and came to his master, who said to him, what did Elisha say to you? And he answered, he told me that you would surely recover. But it happened on the next day that he, Hazael, took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, spread it over his face so that he died. And Hazael reigned in his place. So Hazael took a cloth, doused it in water, suffocated Ben-Hadad the king, killed him, murdered him. And by murdering him this way, he no doubt wanted it to look like natural causes. And then he took over as the next king. He's not part of the royal bloodline of that country, but he takes over as the king. Now here's the guy who said, what do you think I am, a dog? I, I could ever do something that bad? Next day he comes, kills the king. Proving the point of Elisha. You really are that wicked. Hazael was a commander, a capable commander of the army, but he was also a, an opportunist. He saw this as an opportunity. The guy's sick. I could kill him. Nobody will know I killed him. It'll look like natural causes. I can take over. And he did. And history proves that this actually happened. Now, we don't need extra sources to prove because the Bible says it happened, but it's interesting that an inscription was found, an Assyrian inscription, uh, the inscription of Shalmaneser III, which says, um, if I'm quoting it correctly, Hazael 
the son of nobody seized the throne and became king. So it confirms that he was not part of the royal bloodline. It confirms that he, by force, took the kingdom under his own authority, and now he's ruling up in Syria. Now, in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, having been king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began to reign as king of Judah. Now, I confess, what we are about to read is going to sound confusing. And here's why. You have not one person named Joram or Jehoram. It's the same name, just two different derivations. But you have two different Jehorams or Jorams. You have Jehoram, Joram up north and Jehoram, Joram down south. You go, oh, this is confusing. They have the same name. Well, that shouldn't be too hard to figure out. Um, if your name is Mike and you meet another Mike, you don't go, I can't believe somebody else has my name. A lot of people have that name. So this was not an uncommon name. It just happened to be that simultaneously you've got the 10 northern tribes ruled by Joram slash Jehoram. It could be called one or the other. It's the same person, two different renderings. The son of Ahab, and you have another Joram, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah down south. Make sense? I hope so. So in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, that's the king of Israel up north, down south, Jehoshaphat, having been the king of Judah, Jehoram, his son, began to reign as king of Judah. So evidently, Jehoshaphat is getting older, sicklier. His son reigns as a co-regent at the same time with his father, he was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, which means he dies at age 40. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so do you get the picture? You have a Je Jehoram here and a Jehoram here. They're related to each other. Jehoram, the king of Israel, is the brother-in-law of Jehoram, the king of Judah. Because Jehoram, king of Judah, marries Jehoram's sister up north. We'll get introduced to her in a minute. Her name is Athaliah, bad news blues, Athaliah marries her, and so now you have a king down in Judah who doesn't emulate the practices of the kings of Judah, some of which are good, Jehoshaphat was a good king, but he's emulating the practices and the idolatry of the northern kingdom. Do you follow? He walked in the way of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done, and here's the reason. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. That's Athaliah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Whoever you marry is important. You can be a godly man and marry an ungodly woman, and you'll have hell to pay the rest of your married life. And you can be a godly woman and you marry an ungodly man. Oh, but he's so cute. And he likes my favorite color. <laughs> and so I'll marry him. And the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. J. Vernon McGee said, if you marry a child of the devil, your father-in-law will make sure you have trouble the rest of your life. <laughs> and because he married the wrong gal, instead of, and, and a lot of people who do this, they call it missionary dating. Oh, I'm going to win him to the Lord. He doesn't know the Lord yet, but he says he's interested. Sure. And he's coming to church. Well, sure. It's because he's dating you and he's going to, you know, tell you what you want to hear. Well, he hasn't given his life to Christ yet, but in the future, 
I think he will. The Lord showed me he will. And so you wait a few months. Well, has he done it yet? Well, no, not yet. A year goes by. Yeah, no, not yet. A couple of years. Well, well, now, well, now he doesn't want me to come to church. And often what happens, rather than the believer elevating the unbeliever, the unbeliever drags the, the, unbeliever drags the believer down to their level. And that's what Athaliah did here. That's what so often happened with Solomon and others, as we've already seen. So uh, be careful who you marry. Now, uh, just a note about Jehoshaphat, because his son now is going to reign. Jehoshaphat was a good king who did a bad thing. Now, let me explain. Generally, he did good things. Generally, he brought spiritual reform. Generally, he walked after God. But he was also a pragmatist rather than just trusting in the Lord. He thought, well, maybe... I can unite with the northern kingdom of Israel and build a bridge and build a relationship with this unrighteous kingdom. And if I do that, we'll be stronger together and we can fight off the other enemies around us than if we were isolated. Makes good military and pragmatic sense, but spiritually speaking, God warned his people and the kings that he was raising up, don't make an alliance with ungodly nations. So once again, he was a good king, but he did a bad thing. In seeking to be very pragmatic rather than very particular in obeying God and, and trusting the Lord, he thought, I'll build an alliance, build unity, but it didn't help. It did not strengthen them. It actually weakened because of compromise. So... Things are going south, down south, spiritually speaking, because he married the wrong gal. And, and yet, look at verse 19, a, a key verse. One of the key, in my opinion, verses in this entire book. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David. David? Man, David's been dead a long time. But God made a promise to David. It's called the Davidic Covenant. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God said, somebody from your household is going to reign from your throne forever. Forever. And that is, will be fulfilled when Jesus returns and rules uh, from Jerusalem, a theocratic kingdom for a thousand years. God made that promise to David. So even though you have a good king doing bad things and his son doing worse things, God didn't give up on him because God made a promise long ago to their forefather, David. Do you realize what good news this is? It's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. Here you have a king. He's a bad king. Uh, that's the son of Jehoshaphat, Jehoram slash Joram. He's walking in the ways of the kings of Israel, yet because he's part of the household of David, it's not who he is, it's whose he is. He belongs to this lineage of David. God said, I'm going to preserve them. I'm going to keep a lamp in this city. I'm going to fulfill my promise to David. Likewise, it's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. You belong to God because Jesus purchased you with his own blood on the cross. Oh, yeah, but I'm not perfect. He knew that going into this deal. He doesn't expect perfection. Oh, but I keep falling. He knew that going into it. It's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. You belong to him. Get used to that grace. Get used to just enjoying the grace of God. I belong to Jesus, not because of who I am or what I've done, but because I belong to him in a covenant relationship. He would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David as he promised him to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. In his days, Edom revolted against Israel's authority and made a king over themselves. So... Joram, this is Joram down south, 
in Judah, went to Zaire. Now that's a little confusing because you think in modern terms, maybe the nation of Zaire in Africa, that is not this. Zaire is an ancient name for Seir or Edom in the Bible. That's that nation to the east, southeast of Israel or, or, or of Judah. So Joram went over to over east in the area of Jordan and all his chariots with him. He rose by night and attacked the Edomites who surrounded him and the captains of the chariots, but his people fled to their tents. Thus, Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day and Libna revolted at that time. Here's the picture. To discipline the people of Judah because of the choices that Jehoram is making, he allowed a country next to them who had been subservient to them, Seir, Edom, for a long time, to revolt and rebel against Judah successfully. So you have a couple of nations that have been vassal nations under the control of Judah. Because of the disobedience of Judah, he is allowing this international upheaval to upset them, hopefully to get them to turn to God. Doesn't seem like it's going to work. So Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day, and Libna revolted at that time. Just another little note you may want to write in the margin of your Bible, look it up later. There's a little book in the Old Testament called the book of Obadiah. Ever heard of it? Obadiah's single chapter, like 24 verses. Obadiah's prophecy to the Edomites could have and probably was given at this time. It is a simple little prophecy given to the prideful nation of Edom because they had broken free of the bonds of Judah, God's people, and were sneering at them. And the prophet says, you are trusting in your pride and your power. You dwell securely and safely in the rocks and the clefts of the rocks, but God's going to bring you down. And they were brought down. Now, verse 23, the, rec the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Answer, yes, they are. When we get to First and Second Chronicles, we'll read more about it. So Joram rested with his fathers. That's a nice way of saying he kicked the bucket. He carked it. He died. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David, area of Jerusalem. Then Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel. So we're, remember, when we date the kings of the north and the south, they're always dated against each other. In the year of this king, this king came into power. In the year of this king, that king came into power. They just keep comparing back and forth. So in the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name, here's this name again, was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, the king of Israel. Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, meant she was the daughter of Ahab, the king of Israel. So Ahab and Jezebel had Joram, and Athaliah as kids. Athaliah marries the king of Judah. The king of Judah is dead, but mom is still around, Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, the king of Israel, and he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Now he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, the king of Syria. So now you have Ahaziah going with Uncle Joram from the north, and the alliance is still together, the north and the south, this, this alliance of expediency against um, 
Hazael, the king of Syria. Verse uh, 28, he went with, with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. It's a, a town up in the northern part uh, on the eastern side of the Jordan River. At Ramoth Gilead, the Syrians wounded Joram. Then King Joram went back to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, the king of Syria, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. So you got a north-south alliance. A guy down south says, I'm going to go see my uncle. I heard he got hurt in that battle. So they're hanging out together. And verse 1, chapter 9, Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, get yourself ready Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, when you arrive at that place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat. Okay, now, I'm going to make things a little more complicated. Not only are there two, not only are there two prophets that sound alike, Elijah and Elisha, not only are there two people named Joram, Jehoram, north and south, there's also two different Jehoshaphats. There's Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. This is not that guy. This is another guy, the son of Nimshi, he is called. Uh, just a, a guy up in the north. Notice Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates. Take a flask of oil pour it on his head, and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and run like crazy. Flee and do not delay. Now, why did he tell him that he needed to run as soon as he anointed him? Because as soon as you anoint somebody else as king other than the living king, you painted a target on your back. Now, this is perhaps why Elijah didn't do it. He's getting old, and he gives it to Elisha, his successor, to do it. By this time, Elisha is getting old, and he's, so he gives it to, you know, one of the young guys, right? He's like, give it to the assistant pastor. Or he can do it. He's younger. He can run faster than me. So anoint him as the king of Israel, um, and then just hightail that out of there. Get, get out of there as quick as you can. A note. This king, Jehu, is the only king in the north that it is said he was anointed as king. Now let me explain the word anoint. Mashach is the Hebrew word for anoint. Mashach means to spread a liquid or to smear a liquid like oil because they would pour oil on the head, they would smear it on the head, they would smear it on the face or on the member of the body that uh, was in question, usually anointing people for service, marking them out. The idea of anointing is you're being marked out for special service, so mashach means to anoint or to spread fluid upon, oil. The word mashach is the root word from where we get another more familiar word, mashiach, messiah, hamashiach, the messiah, the anointed one, the one who is marked by God the Father as the one anointed to bring salvation. So here's a king who is anointed, marked by God for a special task. What is the special task? To bring judgment to the house of Ahab. God wants to get rid of them once and for all. So he anoints this new king, and then uh, the young guy runs and takes off. Verse 4, so the young man, servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, there were the captains of the army sitting. And he said... I have a message for you, O commander. And Jehu said, for which one of us? He said, for you, 
commander. Then he rose, went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over, now notice this phrase, the people of the Lord over Israel. Now again, I hope you were encouraged by verses like this. God is speaking through the prophet about the people of Israel, and he calls the people of Israel my people, the Lord's people. He identifies with them as his people. Even though the people of Israel were far from honoring the Lord as their God. They were into idol worship. They walked away from God. They had been rebellious to God. And even though they had walked away from God, God is not done with them. God still identifies with them. They're my people. I'm their God. And I love that because I know people that it seemed have walked away from the Lord. But the Lord hasn't walked away from them. You keep praying for them. You keep believing for them. Until the day they die, you keep praying for them and reaching out. Oh, they're a lost cause. I remember when they walked with the Lord and they were in church all the time. And now I can't believe the words out of their mouth. Boy, they're so far from God. The Lord may be doing a work. I love this verse. The people of the Lord over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, something that Elijah, the prophet, predicted back in 1 Kings. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. These were two previous dynasties that were completely annihilated by the judgment of God previously. God says, I'm going to make this house like their, those dynasties. Furthermore, verse 10, the dog shall eat Jezebel in the vicinity of Jezreel, and there will be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Then Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is all well? Why did this madman come to you? And he said to them, Ah, you know this man and his babble. Do you ever feel that way around the world? This is how the world sees you. You know that. They relegate people like us who have faith in an unseen God as nuts, crazy, not in touch with reality. They said of Jesus, he is beside himself. Festus said of Paul the Apostle, your much learning has made you mad. The world takes the highest possible wisdom and calls it foolishness. And... The Lord said in Isaiah chapter 5, Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil and put light for darkness and darkness for light. That's what the world does. Takes our values and says they're narrow-minded and discriminatory and hateful. I was reading an article today about a woman in England who would go to the abortion clinics and she would stand outside in front of the abortion clinic. She wouldn't say a word. She wouldn't protest. She wouldn't talk to anybody. She just bowed her head and prayed. And she was arrested on three different occasions. Her crime, they said, was a thought crime. That's what the British authorities said. It's a thought crime. You were thinking thoughts that weren't right thoughts, good thoughts. We're going to arrest you for that held her in jail for hours, got taken to court. Two different occasions taken to court. Thought police now. The world thinks that we are guilty. Oh, they're a bunch of idiots, crazy. Madmen besides themselves. Their much learning has made them mad. And so he just sort of plays with, ah, oh, you know this guy and his babble. 
And they said, no, that's a lie. Tell us now. So he said, thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on the top of the steps. And they blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. The idea of putting one's garments on the ground, we see that in the Gospels where the crowd on the Mount of Olives did that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, same idea. They're, it's an act of subservience. So they are basically saying, uh, long live the king. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Remember, Joram is the sitting king in the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Joram had been defending Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, against Hazael, the king of Syria. So they're having this little battle up in the north. Jehu is with his men in another city. The trumpet is blown. Jehu is king. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him when he fought with Hazael, the king of Syria. And Jehu said, if you are so minded, let no one leave or escape from the city and go tell it in Jezreel. So look, you want to make me a king? You want to uh, recognize me as the king and blow the trumpet? Don't let anybody here leave the city and go tell it in Jezreel because that's where the king is. And then, you know, we're in, we're in deep water. So we have to stage this just the right way. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram was laid up there. Ahaziah, the king of Judah, came down to see Joram. Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came. And he said, I see a company of men. And Joram said, get a horseman and send him out to meet them. And let them say, is it peace, or are you coming peaceably in peaceful means? So the horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. And the watchman reported, saying, the messenger went to them, but is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman, who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. And the watchman reported, saying, he went to them and is not coming back. So you get the idea. They're looking out on the plains from the tower on the wall of the city, and they see these chariots coming down the dirt road. Send out a messenger. The messenger falls in line with the group that is still coming. Sends out another messenger. Falls in line with the group that is still coming. Now they're still looking at this company. He went up to them, said he's not coming back, and... The driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. I've known people who drive like this. <laughs> Put them behind a car. They're like Jehu. They drive furiously, weaving in and out of traffic. And so Jehu had quite a reputation. So Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, the king of Israel, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. They went out to meet Jehu, met him on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. Do you remember that? Remember King Ahab wanted the vineyard of Naboth? And Naboth said, I don't want to sell it. Jezebel said, I'll get it for you. Had Naboth killed and gave it to her husband. It happened... When Joram saw Jehu, verse 22, that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And so he answered, what peace? As long as the harlot trees of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Then Joram turned around and fled. He knew this was a coup. He knew that this guy, Jehu, had come to kill him. So he turned around and, and started to flee and said to Ahaziah, the guy down south, the southern king who came to visit him while he is convalescing, he said to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. Now Jehu drew his bow 
with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms and the arrow came out at his heart and he sank down in his chariot. So he, he got the point. <laughs> and Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite for remember when you and I were riding together behind Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth, the blood of his sons, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore, take and throw him on the plot of ground according to the word of the Lord. You may remember this was a prophecy by Elijah back in 1 Kings chapter 26. Now it's going to come to pass. He dies on that plot of land. When Elijah made the prediction to Ahab, Ahab did something that was out of character for Ahab. He tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on. He repented. He humbled himself before the Lord. And just because he humbled himself momentarily before the Lord, God was merciful enough to say, you know what? Because he humbled himself before me, I'm not going to execute judgment on him per se, but the judgment will fall upon his kids, Jehoram, Athaliah on his son when he's in power. So that is exactly what is going to happen. It bypassed, the brunt of the judgment bypassed Ahab, falls on his son Joram slash Jehoram on this plot of land. But there's one important character left, and that is the wife of Ahab named Jezebel. I thought we would have time to finish it. We're almost done with the chapter, but I'm two minutes over time, so we're going to stop here and pick it up next time. Father, you tell us in your word that you have written things in previous times, the Old Testament, to be for us a warning, to serve as instruction, object lessons. And we admit we are less familiar with stories like this than stories in the book of Acts or in the Gospels or in the epistles. But Lord, they're vital stories nonetheless. And it's a story of your sure judgment based on your righteous character, but also your willingness to be merciful, to extend grace, to stand up for your people even when your people have turned against you, to notice an overt demonstration of even a similitude of humility and to let that stand as enough for you to bypass judgment on somebody. So Lord, we see how you balance both justice and mercy, righteousness and grace. And we realize that we are recipients of that grace that we belong to you because of what Jesus did for us. So there's a covenant. And we think now of those people that we know that have wandered, that have walked away, that once were in fellowship, that are no longer in fellowship, that are uncertain or seemingly unbelievers. And perhaps you would refer to them still as your people and you are drawing them back. We pray that you would, Lord, extend in this coming year mercy to them and bring them back that we might see them among our ranks once again in Jesus' name. Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.